using his freedom of speech to its fullest extent. It's John James and Freedom's Pep Rally. Now, America's friendliest host, your buddy, John James. I'm your friendly host, John James, and we are ready to rock into our number two. We have a very special guest. If you have any questions for Major General Jeffrey Schlosser, you feel free to post them, and uh, we are more than happy to uh, ask. And uh, Major General, uh, first of all, thank you for your service. Welcome to Freedom's Pep Rally, sir. Hey John, thanks for having me on the show. It's it's uh it's you you've you've been in Afghanistan. You've been where the the action is going on or where it has been going on for the last week. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, I think the scenes for most Americans are pretty horrific. Um, yeah. But yeah, I spent a lot of time there, 15 straight months uh, in combat leading 30,000 soldiers there and from the 101st Airborne Division. Unbelievable. And the stories, how, how, how are you feeling now that you've seen this, this sudden, sudden, hastily done withdrawal and what is happening, not just to Afghani citizens suddenly, but also to Americans who are trapped there? You know, John, I mean, I got to tell you that, uh, you know, there's a, that's kind of ripped out my heart a little bit. Um, you know, my family has been involved in Afghanistan for a lengthy period of time. My dad was a, uh, lied about his age, couldn't get into World War II, but tried. And so he was in the Army of Occupation in Germany, and I was a youngster in the kid, as a kid in the 50s, and later served in Korea, three tours in Vietnam. But when he retired, he was a contractor helping the, the Afghans after 9-11 to develop the Ministry of Defense. I did 15 months in Afghanistan and prior to that, you know, several tours over there as far as short trips. Uh, my son served in Afghanistan in combat. Three generations, John. Uh, mm. You know, we don't believe in forever wars in my family, and I don't believe that as a military professional, uh, albeit retired. But what I do believe is, is that there are proper ways, proper ways to plan, you know, withdrawals of this nature. There are ways to also protect our national interests, which means, you know, we have a government and a military to protect American citizens and our interests abroad, which means our economy, our uh, democracy, things of that nature. You know, a lot of these have been put into question, uh, at least regionally, by this, um, I would say, you know, uh, catastrophic withdrawal. What we're seeing on, you know, on, on the TV screens and things of that nature are just, I think, a hint of what's actually happening in Afghanistan. Now, you see many of the people on various news channels are uh, there's one I'm thinking of in particular who are praising, I, I don't know how they're doing it. Maybe you can shed some light on this, praising Joe Biden for something that we should have done. And he is he is doing what needed to be done. Uh, I don't think there's much argument. He's not doing it the way it should have been done, but they're still crediting crediting him with doing the right thing anyway. What could have been done differently in your mind? Well, there are several options. First, I mean, John, I would have preferred that, uh, you know, we would have talked to the American people. I realize many people want to get out of Afghanistan. I would have reminded them that we still have troops, thousands of troops in Japan, Germany, South Korea, and Kuwait, as well as right. Kosovo, all fights that we thought that were important to us, but all places that we want to continue to be at. You know, those numbers far exceed what that we had in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we had about 2,500 troops, basically. Right and a group of uh, contractors, uh, and then about 8,500 uh, NATO troops that uh, combined to provide what I will call the backbone of the Afghan Army and the Afghan Air Corps. You know, I mean, there's a lot of shaking of heads and saying after 20 years they ought to have been ready. You know, I mean, a lot of this is just being misreported, some of it by officials who ought to know better. I mean, I keep hearing these numbers about 350,000 security forces. Well, guess what? There's only a, at the height of the army, there was 118,000 uh, Afghan army troops, of which I would say due to the endemic corruption, only one third of them, uh, no, uh, probably two thirds of them were actually real soldiers. 
The wow. other one word were ghost soldiers, right? Uh, there were names only, they were long dead or made up names, and that pay that we were paying went to directly to their commanders. But some part of that two thirds were fairly well trained. Uh, the rest of those numbers, by the way, are national police, which are probably one of the most corrupt organizations on, on earth. They make the mafia look like uh, the B team. Um, but, but NATO and America were the, you know, the backbones of the Afghan army. Yeah, you know, when we decided to set a date certain in the manner that we did, and then just started withdrawing, just, you know, right away. I mean, I mean, closing Bagram Airfield was, that, by the way, that was my headquarters, was insane you know, prior to uh, to this uh, trying to get people out of the country, including our American citizens, 10 to 15,000 Americans. Wow. Um, you know, uh, having the, the commander, the four star commander, General Miller, leave uh, prior to this being done, again, just does not make sense. So whether you agree or not that we should have stayed there, I think, you know, for a handful of soldiers, we should have stayed and protect our interests because I, I can get to what the real problem is, and that's going to be Al Qaeda. Um, but I think we should have stayed and protect our interests. No matter what, though, if we decided to withdraw, and two, two administrations, you know, said said that we would, then and, and I, I understand that. I, you know, we work for uh, uh, civilian authorities uh, that run our country. Then we should have done it in a much more deliberate manner. We could have done this so that the the country didn't collapse into chaos like this. Right. They, you know, I mean, it took it would have taken planning, good execution, and a bit more time. And oh, by the way. The, uh, the complete authority to say, Taliban, if you screw with us, we're going to whack you and you're not going to like it. Now that, see that, Donald Trump, we, he, he drew down the troops to 2,500 from what were they? Uh, by the way, we are talking with Major General uh, Jeffrey Schlesser, uh, uh, author. Now, uh, we also want to talk about your book, Marathon War, Leadership in Combat in Afghanistan where you detail a lot of the stuff you experienced, correct? I absolutely do. I mean, and, you know, I, I certainly didn't predict all of this. I mean, but what I did say is, is that at the end of the day, we are going to have to eventually come to grips with the Taliban. But I, did, I never saw them being allowed to take over the country. I just didn't see it that way. Um, but I do talk about the corruption and the level uh, of, of endemic corruption that's in this culture is just baffling to most Americans and most folks that uh, we, uh, you know, we, we work with uh, around the world. Anyway, I do co cover a lot of this. I actually do cover about some of the things that are really important that you see that today among our leaders. And that, did, that is the, the responsibility to have moral courage, to have competence, and then have character to, car you know, to carry out what you say you're going to do. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a timely book, but let's get back to Afghanistan. I mean, you know, uh, uh, as this is unfolding, you know, it's going to be a real challenge to kind of put the genie back in the bottle for a while. You know, right. all that said, John, I mean, I write in my book, uh, we can forget about Afghanistan because I talk about this potential here, the, what's happening. Uh, but Afghanistan's not going to forget about us. And what I mean there is to highlight uh, uh, a transnational uh, uh, terrorist group that many people have, may have forgot about. It's called Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, yeah. Now, do, yeah. do you think? Do you think this, the latest developments, have put us at a at a higher threat to our homeland? I I do believe so. I mean, John, that's my personal opinion. Uh, yeah. I do believe. You know, I did. I was the deputy at the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, you know, I, I briefed President Bush on our war and terrorism plans uh, way back before I went into Afghanistan. Um, so I'm not a neophyte and I'm not naive about, uh, you know, Al Qaeda. Uh, we did a great job of whacking the heck out of them, you know, finally getting Osama bin Laden, but that it's a belief in, in an ideology. Um, and, uh, so you can kill all the leaders you, you know, you, you want, but eventually it's going to continue to, you know, go through mainstream or other folks in, and uh, not mainstream, but, uh, you know, throughout those who want to believe in that. We yep. are going to see Al Qaeda again uh, try to plot against America or American citizens abroad or our allies. And uh, we just need to be aware of that. I don't want Americans to be fearful. I think we're a strong country, you know, at heart, and we are strong people. Um, so we shouldn't be fearful. What we ought to do, though, is, is demand that our government and our intelligence agencies also focus on Al Qaeda as they're trying to do other things. Major General Jeffrey Schlosser with us uh, this hour on uh, Freedom's Pepper Alley here on Legacy 1160 WSKW. 
Uh, now, now I know being Monday morning quarterbacking does no good, but how, how do you think and do you think Donald Trump was handling it the way it should be handled? And how do you think it would be had he still been in office? What do you think the difference might have been? Or is that just pointless to even try to figure out at this this time? Well, you know, I really don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, at this point in time, I mean, again, I think both this administration and the previous administration, both presidents felt that they needed to get out of this forever war, as they called it. You know, I mean, I, and in my gut, John, I don't agree with the thought that uh, it was actually a war by that time. I mean, uh, you know, President Obama had downgraded this whole thing and the number of troops were down to, uh, I mean, President Trump did, you know, uh, decrease them as well during his time, but they were down significantly from the time uh, and during the surge, as I will call it, that I, I'll be honest with you, in my book, I talk about the requirement. I. I said, we need to have more troops. I told that to President Bush face to face. Yep. I told Senator Obama when he came over and visited us, and I, I flew him around in my Blackhawk for a, a full day, all around Afghanistan, and um, all the way out to some troop areas. And I said, you know, Senator, if you become president, we need more troops here. We're not going to win this at the pace that American people can put up with. Um, and both, I mean, they both supported a, a what I would call a surge. So. The, the addition of troops, I'm partly responsible for, and, and I believe that at the end of that, that we were actually making progress. I do believe that President uh, Obama took the number of troops down too quickly, and uh, and then, of course, it continued. I guess what I will tell you, John, is is that, you know, my position would have been for, is one, declare the war over as far as America is going. We have basically done that. We're here there to advise we're going to be the backbone logistically. We're going to provide air support as needed to uh, to the Afghans as they learn how to fly the aircraft that uh, you know that they've got, um, and to be able to provide that direct support. Um, the Afghans have been doing the fighting for years. The sixty six thousand right. Afghan soldiers are dead. Um, think that number. I mean, ours were two thousand four hundred forty three, which is in you know horrific. Believe me, I know I've tried. I lost 180, John, and my, under my watch. I wake up in the morning thinking about them. I go to bed thinking about them at night, and I take full responsibility for that. You know, um, they were doing my orders. Um, what I will say though is, is I think for a handful, literally a handful of troops, some air support, and contractors on the ground, we could have continued to protect Afghanistan, but more importantly, protect us. Uh, which is my biggest fear. I mean, again, I'll make it one more time. You're probably tired of it. Al Qaeda is in that country again. They came in just as the, the Taliban came in. They will start forming camps. They will start training. They will start planning. So we were more. Would you would you almost say uh, sort of a peacekeeping force when we're down to 2,500? And also, uh, how much of Afghanistan? was previously before the new administration being occupied by the Taliban. I mean, we saw it grow exponentially here over the, the past month or so, you know, it was 40, 50, 60 percent. And now they're going to take Kabul in 90 days. And and now it, this weekend and it it amped up very, very quickly. Um, do, do you think had there not been the promise to get them out by a, a set time, the 2,500 that were there, that the Taliban would have thought long and hard about trying to consume the whole country the way they did? John, I believe that it was a big mistake to set a what we call a date cer certain uh, and then make no requirement for your other um, you know, who you're negotiating with or who you made this agreement with to do what they said. Now, I mean, my personal belief is you can't trust the Taliban. It's based upon my experience in Afghanistan. Right. right. Um, but, but you can still work through negotiations with somebody that you don't trust. Then you do that through milestones, red lines, things of that nature. You know, if, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I will take some number of troops out. If you do this, I'm going to start moving as much as, my, as I can, American citizens out of the country. Um, that could have been done in a much more deliberate process. But in April, I, I personally believe by making a decision, you know, 9-11, which was like a crazy tone deaf, uh, you know, date, but then 31 August, I think what that did was it emboldened the Taliban for two things. One, get in the country and do as much as they possibly can to take over politically, 
which is what they mainly did. They, it was a brilliant campaign to bribe people or to force them out of the other uh, out of their government positions by saying, "Look, you got two options: we'll kill you, or you get free free travel out of the out of the area." Right. right. Um, and I, I think that that say, date certain was a huge strategic error. Um, I think we should have basically said, if we had made the decision we were going to completely leave, one, taken a, a very deliberate process, been very honest with the Taliban that, look, you screw with us, and we're going all the way back to ground zero, and you're number, tar number one target, okay? Um, but otherwise, we're going to you know, proceed outward in a very deliberate manner. Um, it's very different than what you saw executed here. Yeah. Yeah. Th this was, boom, it was done. And uh, cause and effect. You you start to pull troops. Tell me if I'm wrong. I, I certainly, uh, my dad was a U.S. Marine. Uh, I was disqualified for the military because of some physical things. Uh, so I'm certainly not a, a mastermind when it comes to military. But I, I, I think it would, wouldn't it have been smarter to pull the troops out slowly and watch what the reaction of of the taliban was and if they started to try to move in as troops were being pulled out uh then you draw that line and you start sending troops back in i mean is that overthinking it no it's it's as simple as that now you know none of us that are military men and women are brilliant uh you know as far as uh, you're not going to find too many geniuses out there may be a few exceptions you take facts and then you actually base your, you know, your planning on real reality and, and, and human responses and things of that nature. That's exactly, John, what I think we could have done or we should have done, you know, and to get back to your other question, I won't call us a peacekeeping force that we were there. Uh, but what I would say is, is that it was an advisory force, mm -hmm. uh, not doing any direct combat. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, not a, there was not a combat casualty from America's side in a year and a half. Uh, in Afghanistan, still hasn't been. Um, and so think of it as an advisory force. Now, if you're the Air Force or Marine Air Corps, um, you know, or, or Navy, and you're flying combat missions, you know, that still is in combat. There's no doubt about it as they attack. But we, again, haven't had a, sh we have not had a jet shot down in Afghanistan, uh, you know, uh, in 20 years. Uh, we've had plenty of Army aircraft and Marine aircraft uh, yeah. helicopters shot down. Um, so anyway, I, my guess would have been is, is that, you know, there was a better way to do this. It did not have to happen this way. In a sense, this is a shameful way for us to, uh, to conclude in Afghanistan. But I'll get back to my point, uh, you know, in my book. You can forget, we can forget about Afghanistan. Afghanistan's not forgetting about us. Americans ought to regard this as another chapter uh, in the book uh, of our involvement in that uh, strategic country. So uh, I... Where, where was the Taliban uh, moving in before we started to withdraw troops or, or, or yeah. before we announced the date? Yeah, absolutely. They were trying to do their very best in rural areas, way out in the frontier, right. uh, come in with shadow governors. While I was there in 2009 and 10, and, or 8 and 9 as in command, uh, there were actually folks that for a while a Taliban would come in and at night they would go and they'd leave what they called night notes, which is if you support the Americans in your town or your village, we'll come back and behead you. Um, and of course, we did our very best to have soldiers out in the middle of all those little rural villages, right, to help the Afghan army. Um, so, but they were doing that. They were kind of, you know, coming up on the edges. They were nowhere near at that time sophisticated as they are you know, today. And of course, I mean, one of the things you haven't mentioned, John, nor have I, is, is that, uh, you know, the, the Taliban went from increasingly getting American arms as they would, you know, uh, come into that country over the last, really the last year, and make uh, significant progress as far as uh, uh, fighting the Afghan army. They would actually steal the, the weapons right. or the ammo. And now there's so much of it left over. They basically have all the weapons and the ammunition and including some aircraft from the Afghan Army and Air Corps. And so they went essentially within a space of about a couple of weeks from being a much more rural insurgency to being a very well armed uh, army for a, you know, for a country of that uh, size uh, in that area of the world. And that's going to be in a, of interest. Uh, over a period of time, especially as they try to put more influence in countries like, uh, say, Pakistan over the next several years. Right. Uh, the Taliban are well armed now. So what What now? I mean, what, what do we do now? This This is, 
this is monumental proportions. I mean, this we lost Kabul. We've lost the country. The Afghans have lost the country. Afghani women are, despite what the Taliban says about, oh, we're going to build schools and we're going to, you don't, you, you can't believe them. Uh, I mean, I mean one, one that, you know, most Americans need to know that, uh, you know, the Taliban came back into the country with a very well greased uh, public media team. And uh, what you see from them is going to be based, uh, you know, upon strictly what their leaders want to show. I think they're going to show, they're going to demonstrate through the media that they are benevolent, that they're sophisticated, that they want to be inclusive of, you know, all the de- different uh, genders and ethnic uh, groups there. In other words, men and fem- male and female. And, you know, there are um, three major, maybe four, uh, if you want to count uh, uh, some others, Tajiks. Uh, in that country, ethnic groups, uh, which before they they basically repressed, uh, you know, uh, almost everybody that wasn't Pashtun. Okay, um, you're going to see uh, that on the surface. What the reality is going to be is those little reports that come out from you know the other cities in the country, from the villages, from the rural areas, where what I understand the women have been ordered back in the home. They cannot come out with a male companion. They got to wear a burqa, which is a blue sheet. No place to see out of that. And oh, by the way, you know, they can do whatever they want to as far as work, as long as they do it from home. And, and yeah. again, this is not a place that has Wi-Fi and things of that nature, right? So, I mean, the repression of women is gonna be absolutely significant. What I will say is, is that, you know, we've, we've achieved two things over the service of our country there and, and, uh, and the service of our vets. One, we kept America, uh, you know, uh, safe from Al Qaeda for two decades. That's right. me in jeopardy now, but for two decades, that's that's our whole generation. And then two, we gave hope and promise and reality uh, to a whole generation of Afghans that were born after 9-11. And, uh, and I don't think they're going to go away. You know, they may come to other countries. They may stay there and protest, but they're not going to go away. And so those are two laudable okay. things uh, that I think we can say that America did do uh, while we kind of get through this mess. Because it, it's just very, it's very sad to see this play out from the perspective of the Afghanis, is especially the the video, the visuals of, you know, them trying to get into the wheel wells of the cargo planes and then falling to their deaths. I mean, uh, they they know what this means and and they want out, and now it looks like we are going to uh, welcome an influx of people from Afghanistan. In fact. Uh, it, it's said by some outlets that Joe Biden is looking to get more Afghanistan, more more Afghans into America before he gets all of the Americans who are in Afghanistan back to America. Yeah, uh, and, and are these people, are they going to be vetted? I mean, how important is that? Even the uh, interpreters who have helped us, uh, some have turned on Americans. Are they going to be vetted? This is all, these are all worrisome questions. Yeah, I think for, I mean, well, my personal opinion is, is number one priority is American citizens. As I said, 10 to 15,000 American citizens there. The next priority ought to be those that have been through the process and been vetted because uh, there's still a number of them there. They need to get the heck out of the country before they right. And then follow on on uh, the other people that can prove that they work for America. Uh, then they're the next priority. I mean, I, the sheer numbers though are just so significant, John. I think it's going to be a real challenge, especially if... Uh, if, you know, uh, either the Taliban get tired of us being there and start uh, creating you know, disturbances that uh, we decide are too violent for us to remain, um, or uh, we just run out of time and run out of whatever. I mean, you know, it's hard to tell at this point whether we're going to be able to get all these folks out. I do believe that they will be vetted one way or the other. They're just not going to be set free in America. Mm. Uh, well, I can't believe they would be. That's that's me. Right, know? right. So uh, what, what do you think of the... The uh, support staff, the Department of Defense. I mean, what do you think of uh, Mark Milley, Lloyd Austin, uh, even Secretary of State Blinken? I mean, are, are what are these people? Are they not being listened to by the administration? Are they themselves making the wrong decisions? I've again, we hear news depending on who you listen to uh, that they're inept, that they are doing the best they can. Uh, as a military man of as many years as you have been, what would your assessment of, of these gentlemen be? 
Yeah, I, I don't know Tony Blinken. I personally know Chairman Milley. He worked for me as my deputy. If you glance in that book, you'll see his name in there quite a bit. And uh, and I know Secretary Austin from when he was a general. In fact, he was my boss for a little while. Uh, what I will say is, is that the two uniforms, so, well, General Secretary Austin, excuse me, and General Milley are competent. Uh, you have an issue in our country. It's not an issue. It's the way things work. Is is military gives both the uniform and and civilian uh, Department of Defense gives its best advice. They don't run the show, you know. And so uh, whether this administration, president, uh, listen to them or not, I think is debatable, um, you know. And I think that there was there's going to be finger pointing, but clearly between you know the White House, Department of Defense, Department of State, and between state and defense about who who didn't do their job the right way. Um, but I, at this point in time, I would just say that my guess would be that uh, the uniform military, the Department of Defense gave their best advice and it wasn't this. Um, and then we're you know, not allowed to proceed onward with a, 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 a you know, executable deliberate plan. That's my, that's my belief. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, very good. Uh, Major General Jeffrey Schlosser, the uh, the uh, author of a book called Marathon War Leadership in in, in uh, Combat in Afghanistan. And uh, you can get this at, uh, I'm sure, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Is it in uh, Audible as well? Yep, sure is. Uh, read and by Alex Grant from Lone Survivor. Great Audible book. Terrific. Well, that's good. I, I love the audibles. I do. I fall asleep during them, but I, I don't think I will during yours. I'm telling you that right now. Uh, I've also, also got to ask you, uh, from a military perspective, uh, what what do you think about, uh, say, General Milley and others who are bringing, even uh, Lloyd Austin, Secretary Austin, bringing the military into the more woke way of thinking? And uh, let, me that, let me do that real quick, John, because I've got to take another radio show. OK, uh, just really quickly, you know, uh, mili I mean, we have an army, we have a military uh, for really one purpose, and that's to protect America and our citizens. Right. right. Uh, not a social demographic uh, uh, experiment. And uh, my personal belief is, is that, uh, you know, uh, the military ought to be allowed to train and then go into uh, situations where we protect America. Anything else that, uh, you know, is done messes things up. I believe in a diverse force. We ought to look like America. So let me just say that. But uh, we should not be experimenting with our soldiers and sailors, Marine and Airmen, John. Vaccine included? Hey, you know, I mean, I, I can understand, what you know, vaccines. When I was a private, John, I got 12 shots and no one asked me whether I wanted them or not. I, I understand that. Um, you know, and I'm not a doc, so I, I really don't know the difference. Like, you know, what should we or should we not be doing that? Uh, but I, I will just say that, uh, you know, no one asked me uh, back in uh, 1976, hey, you want the shot or not, dude? They just said private. Here's your, give me your arm. Fair enough. Well, listen, I know you've, I know you've got to run. I really appreciate your time. What a great guest. Uh, uh, Major General Jeffrey Schlosser. And I, did I say your name right? Yeah, it's good, John. Yeah, you're, okay. you're doing great. All right. Perfect. And I, love your, and I love your hat, by the way. Hey, thank you very much, sir. And thank you for your service and your time. You have a great day, my friend. Take care, John. See you. Bye now.